Hello and welcome to Faith. I'm Ellen Mora and today we have Pastor Calvin Lott here from his house of his presence, which is having a four o'clock service on Sunday right up the street on Lapeer Cross. Welcome. Thank you very much. So nice to be here, Ellen. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Is this Pastor Calvin with a K? I yes. found out. Yes, with a K and an E. So there we go. Well, that's cool. There must yeah. be a story behind that. Well, I really don't know. My parents just decided to name me Kelvin. I've heard Kevin. I've heard Calvin. I've heard all, all different variations, but uh, Kelvin's kind of a unique variation of it. So that's what they gave me. So that's what I've been used to all my life. So. Well, clearly you've had a calling, and I'm wondering if you could share with us why you decided to become a pastor. Well, I was, uh, I like to say I was uh, going to church before I was even born. I've always been church attenders and very faithful in the church. So I was raised in church. Um, every time the doors were open, we were there. Um, as a teenager, uh, I was your typical church teenager, sat on the back row and uh, would um, not particularly hold to the standards of the church. For I, you always say I got saved twice a year, gave my heart to the Lord twice a year. That was during youth camp in the summer and during youth conventions and the Assemblies of God here in the state we had youth conventions in December. Um, but as an 18 year old uh, after I'd spent a lot of years, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, a lot of just junk, um, ended up getting kicked out of college. Um, I say I got saved for real. Um, the Lord just really touched my life and turned my life around and it wasn't long after that that just sensed a very uh, strong um, call on, on my life to be in the ministry. At that time, it was a youth pastor. I spent 12 years as a youth pastor and uh, did a lot of other things in the church, but um, since that time, uh, been senior pastoring or lead pastoring, they call it now. So it's just been, it's just been a, a long journey. There was a period of some time in there, about 10 years, where I was away from the ministry, and um, that's a long story in itself, but uh, um, it's kind of really formulated and formed me into who I am today and mm -hmm. what my focus of ministry is. So that's kind of how it happened with me. It was just a strong sense that God had something for me that went way beyond. Um, and I figured a lot of the things that I had been through and that I had done uniquely, um, uniquely qualified me to minister to young people especially. And uh, uh, then later on in life, just being able to just relate to people to where they're at. So you went from having one foot out the door, you know, right in the back row, and kind of falling off a little bit to being totally immersed because you really went in a direction that you didn't want to be going in for your life. Yeah. And I, I think we've all encountered, I have a nephew who's struggling with some of the same issues that you did before mm -hmm. you said you made a total commitment to the path you're on. What, and your youth ministry, I'm sure has served you well. What would you give? as suggestions or advice on how to love someone who's going through that process. You hit the key with that one word. <laughs> My philosophy of ministry has always been um, just love Jesus with all my heart and love people. Mm. Um, I always made it, I, I wasn't the most, um, there's some youth ministers out there that are so um, creative, you know, and, and I was never that. I didn't have the real creative gift, but one thing I did have was I loved kids. Mm -hmm. And in any of my youth ministries, and I've ministered in Michigan and Ohio and to various places, um, my, one of my biggest passions was that I never let a kid leave one of my youth meetings that they didn't get a personal hug mm -hmm. from me and mm -hmm. just to tell them that I loved them. Um, so you're reaching out and you're touching physically those kids yeah. in addition to um, and, and it occurs to me what I'm hearing the answer come as you're talking to me is maybe it's not so much about how to change him, the, the, the you know, Josh, my nephew in this case, but how to change my own heart so I can be more loving. Well, it's, it's, it's a matter of accepting young mm -hmm. people where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't, they, they can't hear what you're saying until they, until they hear what you're doing, mm. okay? Um, you can you, you can you can tell people about the love of God, but until you demonstrate it, that's what opens the door. And with young people, especially in, in our age and in our culture today, there are so many young people um, that I call it a sense of fatherlessness, that many of them being raised in divorced families, divorced homes, absentee dads, 
um, absentee parents. They're 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 struggling to find check, their check, identity. Check. Yeah, right. They're struggling to find their identity, and and the thing that they need more than anything else is somebody to look at them and just say, "I love you. Mm. You don't have to perform for me. I love you just the way you are." Because what I found is that if you can if you can love somebody with the love of Christ, which is basically just placing value in people. It's seeing people not as they are, but seeing them as they can be with a, in their life with the Lord Jesus Christ and His plan and destiny for them. Um, it, it's the ability to, when you place that value in them, you open a door that, that they become receptive then um, to what the presence of God can do in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the ability in myself to do anything in anybody's life. Mm -hmm. I know that what the presence of God did for me in one encounter with the life-changing presence of God will do more than all the sermons in the world can do. It'll do more than all the Sundays they sit in the church pew. But when you encounter the, the, that, that presence of the living God, that's why our church, House of His Presence, I don't care if people remember me. What, what I want them to have is an encounter with that life-changing presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I tried to do in the lives of young people. So my philosophy of ministry with adults is the same as it always was with young people. Well, you, you, I can feel still the emotion of that encounter that you're remembering. Mm -hmm. Would Would you be intimate enough to share with us what that was? Sure. The um, there was a couple of different times. Like I said, I was raised in a in a church and in a Pentecostal church. The Assemblies of God is a Pentecostal group. Um, we believe in the moving of the Spirit. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit and their operation within the congregational setting. Um, I grew up in that. I grew up in a church that was very comfortable with letting um, God's presence move and, and touch people in very unique ways. Um, but as I got away from that, it was back in the day when they were very, very, there were more do's and don'ts than anything else. You know, there was a very legal, what we call legalistic um, in the church I grew up in. That is what I rebelled against. Um, was that type of stuff, mm -hmm. um, and I the, the dogma, the, the yeah, not 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 the things that Jesus said, not mm -hmm. the things that the Word of God says, but the things mm -hmm. that man turned them into. Okay, got okay. it. Okay, like the Pharisees. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of like uh, when I was a kid growing up, you couldn't go to movies. They were, you know, that type Bro, of stuff. Yeah, that you know? is, seems strict. Um, yeah. yeah, and and so I rebelled against that, um, and so but when I my my life started going in a very negative direction. Um, I remember one night I was as a, as a young man, I was sitting in an apartment with some of my friends doing what we always did, and that was getting drunk, getting high, just totally wasting our lives, quite honestly, um, that it just dawned on me that um, I was going nowhere and that there had to be something different. That very next Sunday morning, um, we had just had in our church, we had a new youth pastor who came to us from Georgia and uh, was he came into a situation, there was about 18 of teenagers and we were all the same, going down the same path, we'll put it like that. And that Sunday morning, um, there was a special service and he was preaching. I was on the back row and uh, he preached a, a message on the prodigal son. And the time, I can remember, there's very few messages that I remember, but I can remember this one just as clear as a bell. Um, the title of it was The Pig Pen or the Robe. Hmm. That you have a choice in life. You can stay if you're in a pig pen. You can choose to stay there, or you can come back to the Father, and He'll put you in a robe and accept hmm. you just the way you are. And that wow. morning, my life was instantly changed. I said, God, I've given all this other stuff 100. percent I'm going to give you 100. percent Wow. And, and that that that's what started me on the journey. That's awesome. Well, thank you so kindly. Let's take a break. We'll be right back with Faith. Hi, I'm Ken LaPlace and I'm the new director here at OCTV and I'm on a recruiting mission. I want you to join us. Here at OCTV we're launching a new revolution in public access television, one that's going to take us in a direction that's exciting and challenging. We're not just going to make videos here, we're going to make real movies. Movies, for example, with real Hollywood equipment just like you see here. We're going to make exciting uh, videos for online, things that you'll be interested in and you're going to have to have a real creative mind to join us but that's what I want. And then we'll be able to take all that creativeness that you have and be able to 
put that into our editing systems here, some of the finest software packages on the market. We'll teach you how to do animation. We'll teach you how to do motion graphics and put together your videos. And yes, like I said, we'll be able to do some really cool movies here. We'll be able to do that because we have a lot of, of, of equipment that, that you, as a movie maker and, and, and a video person, will love. For example, we've got all the lighting and utensils here. We have plenty of, of, of sound gear. Say you want to become a, uh, uh, a TV reporter. Well, we have an entire set here, and I'll be able to teach you how to be a multimedia journalist. And you'll be able to take that information, and hopefully, maybe you can get a job. I've been in the business for over 30 years and I intend to teach you how to take my experience and use it for your benefit. And of course, we've got sound stages. We're going to do all kinds of bands and interviews and I need your creative minds to be able to say, hey look, I can help you dress this out. I can t tell you what kind of shows I want, but it's going to take you. I'm on a mission. I need your help. OCTV, come on down. Talk to me again. I'm Ken LaPlace. Welcome back with Faith and Pastor Calvin from House of His Presence. So you're saying that you were acting out, wasting away your life by being mm -hmm. wasted, and that there was an awareness that there had to be something more, and that that question, if you will, was answered the following Sunday. Right. The, the, you know, the Bible says, Alan, that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. Mm. So there is always, um, there is always that thing down deep within every person that lets them know there's got to be something more. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the way God created us. And so it was in that moment that I heard, if you will, that voice that said there's got to be more. And uh, started down that journey, went, you know, the traditional church altar call and uh, just walked down. You know, a lot of pe some people get very emotional in those. I, I wasn't. I was just very calm. And I just said, you know what, Th this is a new start, a new place for me. And so it, the journey started then. It wasn't an easy journey. It wasn't that I didn't fall back into sometimes familiar patterns of behavior. But um, my youth pastor at that time uh, was just awesome. He, he, he became a best friend to me. And uh, he mentored me, discipled me, and helped me walk through until I was strong enough to begin to, you know, to handle the journey on my own. And uh, that, probably his influence in my life was, a, was, was tremendous in, um, in kind of leading me down the path of once I understood the call of God of seeing, you know what, I need to do for others what he did for me mm -hmm. so um, and that's where we're so at. he was that male figure that you were alluding to that was strong and supportive and it sounds like the seed in you was just reaching for the sunlight if you will and he was kind of that little shelter that kept you from straying before you had your own strength and your own roots. exactly I, I have my my you know he, he wasn't so much of a father figure to me as he was just that as a, a guide, if you okay. will. A mentor. Uh, yes, a mentor. Um, mm -hmm. My dad, my, 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 my biological father, um, was an awesome man. He's mm -hmm. 82 years old and just, he was a man of God. I mean, mm -hmm. I am who I am because of my dad. He, he was, mm -hmm. I wish every person could have a dad like that. And the picture that you brought, if you would, ah, Pastor sure. Calvin. It's a good looking family. Why'd you bring this as you were what was, what was the guidance and what was the, the message that this represents for you? Well, you know, I just wanted to bring some items that depict what's really important to me. Uh -huh. um, I was going to bring my Bible, but you have one. I have it over there, but you have one here on the table. So that the Bible, God's Word, is just... That's the foundation, you know. It, it's the foundation in my life. It's, it's the thing that, that uh, guides me. Um, but the second most important thing to me is is my family. Uh -huh. um, my wife Tammy, she is awesome. I is mean, that you in the middle there? That's me in the middle, sitting down on the Good chair. Good-looking fellow. You have a little more fur on your face. Yeah, a little more sure. fur on my face and a little more insulation there in this photo. Yeah. Um, but my wife Tammy, um, she's an unbelievable woman of God, just tremendous, and, and she's just phenomenal. I love her to death. And then, so Tammy's in the blue. Yep, she's in the blue. And then the rest of these, we, we are a blended family. Uh -huh. 
Um, Tammy and I were married back in 1999. She had four kids from a previous marriage, huh. and I had two. And so we became the Brady Bunch, three boys, three girls. And uh, my son, Nathan, he's the oldest. Um, he just got married a couple of months ago. Um, her oldest son, Cameron, um, both of those, both of them, um, they live down in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, Cameron's 26. And then there is uh, Seth and Kirsten, our twins, actually. And uh, it's my wife's twins. They're both 23. Seth is actually our worship leader at House of His Presence. Huh. Um, he's got a phenomenal testimony in and of himself. And then my daughter, Stacy, we call them the triplets. They're, they're all 23. Their birthdays are about, um, her birthday is about three weeks different than the other two. And then our youngest is Marissa. She's 17. She's special needs. And um, we just love our family. We, we, we took two families, and that first year was rough. Uh, my wife thought it was going to be a lot harder than it was, and I thought it was going to be a lot easier than it was. So, um, But we came together, and the way we know we, we made it okay is at the beginning, all of our kids all said, we don't want kids, we only want one or two, and now every one of them say, I mean, I'd love to have four or five or six wow. kids. So um, it was successful, or they wouldn't be demonstrating that they wanted to replicate that? That, that, that's, that's it, and, and the thing that's really cool about our family is that um, both sides came together um, from, from, from some very um, rough circumstances. My wife and I both mm. were divorced, um, and that led to a whole lot of different things, but we found each other, met each other at Rochester First Assembly. Where you and, met. and that's the mother church, if you will. Yes, And then yes. the satellite or the north presence is yes. the one we have here in Oxford. That's right, yes. I'm going to change directions if I can. Sure. You said you're a, you came from a Pentecostal background. Yes, ma'am. Are these Pentecostal churches? Yes. Is that, um, like, I don't know much about it. So I think um, voices, um, are there, you know, snakes? There's a lot of stereotypes. Can you help <laughs> me out with this? We, we try to keep the snakes hidden. No, I'm just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> In a basket. Uh, I'm just, Under I'm just, the back row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, Modern-day Pentecostalism was born um, out of what was called the Great Azusa Street Revival back in the early 1900s out in Azusa um, in Los Angeles, California. Um, and what it was, it was a point in time in history where people just began to say there's got to be more to a relationship with God than what we're seeing in standardized religion. And so they began to, the leadership of that move of God began to um, search the Bible and search out the scriptures, preferably in, and preferably in the book of Acts, to see, okay, what, what was it about that early church that we just seemed to be missing? And what they discovered was the, uh, in Acts chapter 2, um, it was called the Day of Pentecost, where, where there was just a mighty move of God and the presence of God um, came and, and there was uh, uh, an experience, if you will, that was subsequent to their salvation experience. It was called the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And there are certain phenomena that went with that. Um, it's all through the New Testament. The Bible talks about it. And that's, out of that was born um, the Assemblies of God and many other Pentecostal denominations. Um, and, and, and so it's the Holy Spirit coming through the congregation yes. in that moment yes. that then behaves in ways that you said are sometimes dramatic. In your, in your case, when yeah. you were saved, it yeah. was really peaceful. Yeah. And so that's what's going on. It's, yes. It's a more intimate activity yes. of of yes. union with God. Right, because it's not necessarily a congregational thing, it's a, it's a personal thing. Okay. It, it's allowing the Holy Spirit um, to, to just move through you. It, it's, and people react in different ways, okay? okay. Um, I could take, you and I could take a, a, a metal object and stick it into an outlet of walls. We're both going to get the same shock, uh -huh. but how we react may be different. Our response to the charge is our yes. own unique experience. Yes. Stay with us if you would. We'll be right back after this break. The new Channel 97, Oxford Community Television. Welcome back to Faith. We've got Pastor Calvin, and I see a couple more treasures on the table. Can you share with us what those are and why you brought them? What story can you tell? Well, this, this right here... Um, People, I, I have this in my office on one of my bookshelves, and people, every time they come in my office, they say, what is that? And I picked it up in the Dominican Republic. It's just a mortar and pestle made out of mahogany is all it is. Um, but 
the, the reason Dominican Republic, the east side, uh, that Haiti's on the west and it's south. Yeah, of Cuba. yeah, yeah. On, okay. on, it, actually, my wife and I, for our tenth wedding anniversary, we went to Punta Cana down there. Uh -huh. uh, on the on, northern shore. Yeah, yeah, on the vacation. So we went to some of the markets one day, and I pick, I saw that, and I picked it up. And the reason it's significant is that um, there's a verse in Isaiah chapter 28 that says, Can I um, get it? "Sure." Yeah. To hold it while you yeah, share this sure. With me. Um, Isaiah uh, chapter 28, it says this that grain cannot be made into bread until it's been ground. Ah. And uh, it reminds me that, that in order for me to bring fresh bread, if you will, to the people that God's called me to minister to, I have to allow the Lord to break me and to grind me. Um, Is and, that what's going on in my life? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting that, that everything, I believe everything in our lives is prophetic. Uh -huh. That what we go through, the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says that God is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our difficulties so that we can comfort others who are going through the same thing. So trouble is really all about compassion building. Sure it is. It's, it's about compassion building and it's about giving you a fresh perspective. Um, you know, you can't, you can't really, sometimes it's hard to really minister to somebody um, until you've been where they've been. Walking in their shoes. Exactly, exactly. For me, it's a reminder of where I came from when I was in the ministry for 16 years full time, um, had the two children and my wife at the time um, just uh, came in and let me know that uh, she didn't love me anymore. She wanted out of the ministry. In mm. fact, she was seeing somebody else. Mm. Um, and, God, what did that feel like? Uh, a kick in the nether regions of your body is what it mm. felt like. Mm. Um, and very, it was a very traumatic time for me. I had to step away from the ministry with my kids. And I, we were in Dayton, Ohio at the time. My kids and I moved back up here. And it was a very, um, a very traumatic time um, for me. Boom. Yeah. Yeah, in there, and, and, and I can tell you this right now, there, there, you know, you, hear, you hear, hear people say, well, you take it one day at a time. Um, during that time frame for me, um, going through dealing with all the things that I had to deal with um, and going through that divorce, a very painful situation, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't about making it day by day, making it a day at a time. For me, it was more, God helped me to make it to the next minute. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really breaking down with this mortar, mm -hmm. the personality shell that sure. was defining who you were. And not just the personality shell, but all of the dogmatic beliefs. Um, you know, it's amazing how you think you believe something until you go through something that tests that belief. I always think faith or life is like an onion, that you, you get it and then you get it and each layer that comes you shed a couple tears and then we think sure. you really got it then boom yeah. and something like this happens yeah exactly and and for me I, I am um, I'm a very transparent individual mm -hmm. what you see is what you get with me and and you could ask you could ask any of my people um, the congregation that I serve uh, they'll tell you the same thing I'm very I'm very transparent so um, I believe in allowing the situations that, that God has brought you through. And, and all I can say is this, is that um, my God is so awesome and, mm -hmm. and He is faithful and He is always there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he really did a work in me that helped me become, after 10 years in a desert, so to speak, of not functioning in my calling, um, that when He released me back into that, um, it, it, it it gave a whole new perspective. And it's amazing the people that God's brought into my path that because of what I went through, I'm able to speak into their lives. And because I'm not speaking as one that's um, out here who's never lived it, but because I have lived it, I can speak real to them. And, and, and that's, that's very important to me. Absolutely. Um, you said for 10 years you were... Yeah, out of the ministry. Correct. I was, what I, I was actually, I was employed in the... Uh, with a tier one supplier to the automotive industry here. A um, couple of companies that designed and built the big conveyor systems um, for the auto plants. And uh, because of that, did a lot of different things, project management, estimating, quality management, a lot of different um, varied things. It gives me, it gave me a unique perspective coming back into the church of what the everyday working man is having to go through on a daily basis, sometimes um, 
sometimes we can, as ministers, we can get very, um, once again, that word dogmatic about you know people well, and being it, committed and, and faithful from and the yeah, daily experiences. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and and so because of that experience, it gives you a little bit more insight in where people's going and what's happening and and that type of thing and what they're dealing with. Um, the same thing with young people. Uh, it's amazing in our church right now in House of His Presence, we have a lot of young adult age um, people that are coming, um, guys and girls, and uh, that God is just really touching. And for whatever reason, and I know it's the presence of the Lord, they're, they're, they're drawn there because God's presence is just ministering to them. But the other thing is that um, I feel very strongly about the fatherlessness and being able to look at somebody and tell them I love them and uh, and here in three words that that I found out that is so missed and needed in people's lives is somebody looking at them and just say I'm proud of you mm. and and so that has just become almost um, uh, it's just something I really feel deep inside just to look at somebody and say I don't care where you've been I don't care what what what's happened you know I I, I throw my arms around you I love you I, I appreciate you for where you're at but let me just tell you something. I am proud of you. And, and that is just, the Holy Spirit has just used that to break walls down. And that's really the philosophy of ministry of both myself and, um, and the, our parent church, Rochester First Assembly, Richard Crisco, the pastor there. That's, that's his philosophy. That's why our, 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 our motto of ministry is just love God and love people. So... Pastor Calvin, I don't even know you, and yet when you look in my eyes and you say, I am proud of you, I, I feel like I'm blossoming inside. And I'd have to say that's the, the strength, as you said, that you bring to the table, is your heart is open and engaged. And as a man, you bring obviously a strength of reason and ration to the table, but I can feel your heart and the love that you have. If I I'm sorry. I was just going to say that, that, that it, it, what, what, especially young men, what young man doesn't crave to hear their dad say, son, I'm proud of you? Uh -huh. What daughter doesn't crave to have her daddy throw his arms around them and say, sweetheart, I'm proud of you? Excuse me. Well, it's an emotional thing. Is it in, in its... It's vulnerable. Yes. Guys don't think it's okay. I mean, my dad didn't tell his sisters that he loved them. Yeah. And he died last November. Mm. And they would have loved to have heard that. They knew. But my dad only shared that he loved my mother. Mm -hmm. He didn't tell that to other right. people around him. Right. And, that's, and, that, and that, that's the sad thing. There are adults today that even with parents that have already passed on, they are still living their lives trying to gain the approval of a parent that's not even, not even around. And, they, and, that, and that will end up going out in all the other relationships. Um, it's, it's been proven scientifically that, that a lot of the promiscuousness in, in young ladies um, you generally are, you are, are developed off of what we call daddy issues. Um, that, that they're, they're looking for that male figure in their life and so they just open themselves up to anything and everything that comes along. The same thing with young men. Um, you know, there, there are men out there that are driven to the point that they just totally, because they're, they're, they're longing, either their father said they were worthless or their father's never said, I love you and I'm proud of you. And so that, that colors their entire life, that colors their outlook. And what I've found, it's not, it's, those words are powerful, but what makes them powerful is that they're energized by the love and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one. He is the one that has the ability to break through all the junk, that has the ability to break down the walls, that has the ability to touch other people. It's been a privilege to have you with us, Pastor Calvin Lott. Thank and you. we want to let you invite them to your church one last time. Okay. Just want to invite everyone, House of His Presence North. We meet at uh, 2450 Metamora Road. It's right at the corner of M24 and Metamora Road. We're in the facilities of New Life Church of God. And uh, we meet at 4 p.m. on Sunday afternoons. And we just throw out the invitation. Come on out. We'll just uh, we'll love on you real good. And, uh, and hopefully you'll experience the presence of God and the life-changing power of God in a way that you'll never be the same. So thank you very much, Ellen. We appreciate the opportunity.
been a privilege to have you, and thank you. It's been a privilege to have you join us as well. I'm Ellen Moore with Faith with Pastor Calvin Lott. Thanks for watching.